Welcome everybody um, to today's wrap up session about the Igloo conference. Um, we have presenters who were both watching online at home and people who were in Belgium. All right, let me find the button. There we go. Uh, so the Igloo conference this year was in Leuven, which is about a 20 minute train ride outside of Brussels. Uh, we arrived during a lovely, lovely heat wave um, across all of Europe. Um, I was in London and Wales the week before and went swimming in Wales in September, which was something I never thought I'd be able to say. Um, but yeah, so it turns out most places in Europe haven't bothered with air conditioning as everybody who was in the lovely buildings at KU Leuven uh, knows about. Um, somebody from KU Leuven told us it was the first time they've ever had a heat wave in September. Um, so that's fun. Uh, and Leuven's a pretty historic town. Um, the university heavily features among a lot of the buildings. Um, and it's also home to the Stella Artois Brewery. But sadly, I didn't have time to make it out there. Um, but I did drink a lot of Stella while I was there. So that's all right. Um, yes, the student cafeteria at Leuven is called Alma. And this is where we ate lunch every single day. And they had branded trays and plates and napkins. And it was all very exciting for a group of ex Libris users <laughs> to be in a cafeteria called Alma. Uh, so the conference was the Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday um, of the 11th to the 13th of September. Uh, the weekend before, there were quite a few pre-conference meetings. Um, as the ANSREG chair, I attended the INUG sessions that were on the Sunday afternoon. Uh, and then Developers Day was also on the Thursday. So it was a pretty long week for a lot of people. Uh, and then, so yeah. The INUG sessions, um, so they're part of the pre-conference meetings that actually also included the Igloo Steering Committee, uh, various working group members, community of practice leaders, as well as various representatives from the international user group uh, groups, which is what INUG stands for, by the way. Um, so the INUG representatives presented reports and highlighted key issues. Um, and that session went for about an hour and we had a general discussion about all of the issues that we wanted to present to Ex Libris. And then immediately following that, um, a bunch of Ex Libris and Clarivate upper management came into the room and listened to our questions and answered some of them. Um, so unsurprisingly to most of you here, probably the biggest issue raised by everyone around the world was always support, various aspects of it, but support. Um, so in response to this, the main notes I took from this meeting, um, Ex Libris are working on a known issues platform. Uh, currently the timeline for that is about two years though. Um, so a lot of the things that were brought up at this meeting in particular were that we used to be able to see other universities, other institutions' cases, and now we can't. Um, but this is a GDPR thing, so it's not something that they can actually really backtrack on. Um, so the known issues platform is going to be their solution to that whenever it arrives. Um, poor documentation was also an issue raised. Um, I wrote down, according to them, the, the ex Libris people who were there, 40% uh, of support cases are how-to questions because their documentation is so poor. I thought that was ridiculous. Um, but I actually also had a meeting later in the week with Tali, who's the head of documentation, um, and she mentioned that her team can't fix a documentation unless they know which specific documentation needs fixing. Um, so she encouraged everyone to click the feedback button on each documentation page and let her team know um, which pages need fixing. So, you know, go ahead, go ahead and swamp them with requests now that you know that. Um, ANSREG representation. So there are quite a lot of um, ANSREG community, both online and in Leuven itself. Um, so we had lots of presenters over the three days. I couldn't count um, looking at the program, but there were a lot. Um, so there were more than 10 of us from Australia and New Zealand present physically. Um, so on the Tuesday night, we gathered as many as we could for a little pizza, pizza party uh, in central Leuven. Um, and that's, I just ran, ran downstairs to get my bucket hat. Um, so <laughs> Caroline and I 
ordered uh, the same beer. And if you ordered two beers and a pizza, you got this free hat. So this hat now belongs to the committee. Um, it's reversible. It's yellow on the inside. It's it's going to come in handy for something. I just know it. Uh, all right. Actual conference stuff. So um, obviously the topic on everybody's lips was AI and how libraries can harness it. Um, there were multiple keynotes about AI as well as individual breakout sessions hiding, um, highlighting some useful artificial intelligence that people are already using. Um, the big ticket item announced by Ex Libris was the Primo uh, new discovery experience. I've also seen them sometimes called the next discovery experience um, that's coming to Primo VE. Uh, it will include apparently conversational AI uh, built into Primo, um, which will give users the actual sources of the information. So it'll it'll if you ask it a question, um, it will bring back a summary answer, but it will also give the user the sources from the collection from the library's collection that um, that information came from. Um, so if you want to know more about that, um, I'm pretty sure that was the strategic vision part two presentation from the Monday morning. Um, and this picture is actually from the my next slide, um, which is the big thing I recommend to watch. Um, so obviously there were heaps of presentations throughout the um, three to four days. Um, that are great to watch, but it depends on what products you have and what you're interested in and what your role is. So I'm not going to mention specific ones. Um, but if you do have some spare time, maybe over the Christmas period, I do highly recommend watching the closing keynote um, from Jerome Byatt. I'm really bad at Dutch. Um, but again, this was obviously about AI, but he's very funny. He has a podcast, which sadly is in Dutch because otherwise I would listen to it. Um, but yeah, so it's a very funny look at the history of AI, the current state of play and where we might be heading um, in the future. And he's a very great presenter. Um, so that's all I have about the conference. Um, I can't remember who was going to go next, but does somebody else want to jump in? I don't think you actually gave us an order, Ella. So. Oh, yeah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> who wants to go I'll, next? I'll get mine over and done with, shall yeah. I? Okay, awesome. Okay, cool. I will stop sharing. Cool, sure. Sorry, is it David? Are you, do, are you presenting as well? I believe so, yes. Cool, okay. Can I just get a confirmation that you should, you can see my my slides? Yes, I can see that. Thanks. Um, I just have a few. Um, and I actually didn't get to that closing presentation that um everyone was raving about how funny it was. Um, but I, <laughs> when I offered to do this for the committee because I went, I was a, someone who went along to the conference and presented. I was like, I have to confess that I actually didn't go to many presentations um, because I was going to so many meetings and um, doing other things. So this is just, it's if anyone is considering going to the Igloo conference, basically this slide is all about um, the advantages that you get other than watching the presentations, uh, which, you know, going and sitting there and listening to people share things. Uh, so I obviously attend a lot more meetings as well because I'm the coordinator of the Igloo working group. So some of these meetings that I attended um, were on the basis of that. Like, so on the Tuesday morning, for example, the Primo working group members who were attending the conference had a meeting with Primo Product Management, which was Guy Ben Pratt and uh, Israel Kucha. Nelly wasn't there, um, Nelly Natan. So if anyone um, hasn't heard yet, she's just about to have a baby, like it's imminent. Uh, so she's been replaced by Amy Pemble. Uh, so it was sad not to see her, but she is literally about to pop. Uh, so other meetings though, like I went straight from that meeting to a meeting with Alma, one of the Alma product managers, and she contacted me before the, you know, before I traveled to the conference to say, do you have time to get together? She'd like to pick my brain about sharing things like the new UX that's rolling out and an opportunity to talk about pain points and things like that. So I was like, yeah, sure. So I missed 
the sessions because of that sort of thing because I'm I'm glad that the Igloo Steering Committee makes the presentations available because I was like, well, I can watch them later and I'll go and have these important meetings. <laughs> um, not that the presentations wouldn't have been awesome, but, uh, I, you know, you have to juggle your time. And it's a good opportunity as well because I met up with someone from the Aluna Primo Working Group who was also at the conference and I was like, come along to my meeting um, with the Alma product manager now, which was Nilly, uh, sorry, Lily. Uh, so, and we also had an opportunity to meet, I'm on the UX group just recently for the Alma UX focus group, but we also got together on the Tuesday again um, to have a chat through how that's progressing. And I also met up with the that Aluna Primo Working Group rep again for some work that we're doing in the Primo Working Group uh, on the Igloo and Aluna side. Another thing that's really good if you manage to get to the conferences is to have a meeting with support for your site. So that's what I was doing on the Wednesday afternoon in lieu of <laughs> the closing keynote because uh, I didn't have any other time. But I don't know if they reach out to everyone who's going to the conference because I know that they trawl through like the attendee list because obviously they've got finite time as well. So if you were going and they didn't reach out to you, I would do it myself. Like I'm pretty noisy. So <laughs> I think that they would always um, uh, tap on my door. But, um, you know, just it's a good opportunity to share pain points. Uh, Jed was there, Jed Gilmore, for the first half hour, and then he had to skip off because he was catching a flight. Uh, but I met with, there was two people, I think, from Alma side and one person from the Primo side. And we're also in a, something called the Customer Care Program since we went live with Alma and Primo in 2016. So I got to meet my rep uh, in the flesh as well. And other than all of that, um, usually your social calendar is full as well, which of is a great networking opportunity. Uh, so Ella's already mentioned that we got together all the ANSREG attendees that we could figure out who was there. And I think Ella, we should do that in advance next time <laughs> to make sure that we get everyone. Um, yeah, part of the but... <laughs> part of the problem was I was on holidays the week and a half beforehand yeah. and wasn't checking my emails. So uh, yeah, it was partly yeah. on me. <laughs> No, it's all good. Like we tend to gravitate towards each other. Like it just happens, right? You hear the accent and you're like, where are they? <laughs> and you hunt people down. Uh, but, and I can't remember who suggested it. Someone who was, oh, sorry that I can't remember the name of the person who said, are we going to get together? Because they were a new I site. I think it was Joe. Yeah. I think it was Joe. 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 Yeah. Right. It was a great suggestion. So, because usually we just naturally gravitate, but I think it's good to actually organize something. Uh, and shout out as well to the Igloo Steering Committee. Dave Allen always puts on a feast for us um, at a restaurant for the steering committee and the coordinators as a thank you for the work that we do. Like I call it my second job uh, that I do for the Igloo um, organisation. So it's great um, that the steering committee recognises the work that we do and is an opportunity to all get together um, and you know, do that schmoozing thing. It just helps with relationships. You know, when you're the whole year, you just like doing cold emails, you know, it's all in text form and you don't have the opportunity to really connect with people. So um, that's why I wanted to highlight this as part of um, what I'm sharing back with you today. And my only other slide is my focus more on my experience as a presenter, um, because some of you might go as attendees, but not necessarily uh, present and I'd like to encourage you to do that uh, and one way that I would encourage you to do that is to let you know that we will support you uh, so on the conference planning committee which I'm on uh, we have to do moderation um, of sessions so another reason I didn't actually get to attend many sessions myself the only ones I got to listen to were the ones I was moderating for <laughs> pretty much um, which was like I think it was all of Wednesday afternoon and all of, sorry, all of Tuesday afternoon and all of Wednesday morning, um, I was moderating sessions. So, and I contacted everyone in advance. So Peter, I don't know if Peter's, I think Peter might, Hopkins might be away, but I moderated her session, for example. So you'll be contacted in advance to make sure you're all comfy 
and uh, you'll have a physical moderator and a, an online moderator. We're there to help with anything that goes wrong, just making sure that you say the time and give you reminders, whatever you need. So if you're a nervous presenter, um, just know that you're supported in this um, and don't let that hold you back from sharing with the community. <laughs> But otherwise, I did my presentation. Ella, I've just responded to your email to say that you can lift the embargo. <laughs> Sorry that it took, because I presented right. building cultural I sensitivity <laughs> into Primo in July. I'd already submitted the proposal for Igloo. Uh, and then the ANSREG conference came up and I was stepping off the committee then as well. So I stepped away from that organization, but I volunteered to get something together a bit more quickly to present it in July for ANSREG. And so I asked for that to be embargoed until um, I could present at Igloo in September. So I, of course I took the opportunity to review it and update it and refine it for what I did uh, in Igloo. But I don't think I need to go into too much detail about that because you'll probably all see it now if you're interested in that body of work. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the other thing I presented was the um, as my position as the Igloo Primo Working Group Coordinator, as I've mentioned. So we always do an open meeting and I, that's available for you to have a look at as well, as Ella's been mentioning. But I just picked out some things there that I took away from that presentation myself because it's, it, it's again, it's not just me lecturing at people who come along and saying, listen to all the wonderful things that we do. It's also an opportunity for people in the room to have that dialogue with me and make suggestions. And for like the first one on the list there um, is one that I thought of off the top of my head during the presentation. I was like, hey, does anyone actually read the meeting notes that I that I spent time to put on the website and everyone was like we didn't even know they existed uh, so I suggested that I would just uh, post to the listserv uh, when those notes were available as a prompt for people to mosey off to the website and have a look at those notes and I'm a lurker we don't have Leganto at UQ but I'm a lurker on the Leganto list and I think I saw Jesse's name I think Jesse started doing it too <laughs> I think it was because we talked about it at the meeting, the last meeting on the Thursday. So, Jesse, if you're there, good move as well. Um, so, I don't know how much time I've got left, Ella, or how much detail you want me to go into these. If you want me to talk through any of them, if anyone has any questions about any of these sorts of things, I'm happy to answer them. But otherwise, yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, does anybody have any questions for Stacey? Get them in now, or you can think about them while somebody else is talking as well. Yeah. All right, thanks, Stacey. Um, no David, do you want? Do you have anything to share? Do you want to? Yeah, go next? sure. Uh, awesome, thank you. So. Um, <clears throat> Ella and I originally planned, so Ella and I both work at La Trobe University Library, um, and we originally planned to do like a lunch and learn session for the library last week, which would then flow into this session. Uh, but now, for various reasons, we couldn't do it last week, and I was away sick the start of this week, so I've thrown together some slides. Let's see how they go. Um, so just as a context, can everyone see that? Yes. Um, so, hi, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is David Witteveen. I am the coordinator of library discovery systems at La Trobe Uni. That basically means I look after Alma and Primo, and therefore my interest at Igloo was very much focused on Alma and Primo. Unlike Ella and Stacey, I attended online, which I will talk a little bit about at the end, because uh, I, this is the second year that I've attended online and I, I definitely have thoughts about it now that I'm in my 50s. Um, all right, four highlights. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna talk, I didn't do any fancy meetings or anything like that. I just attended as an attendee. So these are some of the highlights that grabbed my attention. Maybe they'll grab yours. Um, this library futures part two report from technology from Sage, I thought was, 
a very interesting thing. I am relatively new to the academic library sector. I've been at La Trobe for two years, and this is my first time working in an academic library. Um, before that, I was working for a vendor. I was working at OCLC. And the first question I have is like, do we actually know how our people, like how students actually search for information? It's all very well having a beautiful primo. Like, do we actually know? Um, and that's one of the things that was covered off in this technology from Sage report. You can sort of, I've, I've copied two of the graphs from, uh, I think it's like about a 30 page report. But um, the first one was, how do you find resources for your assignments and studies? And the second one was, where do you look first? And I thought it was very interesting that Google is the number one result on both of those because I just finished my master's last year. And I don't know that Google was always the first thing that I would turn to, but it's certainly there was a lot of Googling. It's like, particularly when I, I search for stuff in Primo and not getting any good results. And it's like, am I not finding results because there's nothing out there? Or am I not finding results because I'm not using the right terms? So I thought that was, that's very interesting. Um, but, the particular relevance of this report, I guess, for my role is we are going to be looking at our primo again next year. And so that's a good theoretical basis to start from. Um, I must admit, I've also I've printed the report out. It's sitting on my desk. I've read half of it. I still haven't finished it. <laughs> um, the second thing, obviously, the next discovery interface, that's going to be a huge thing for our institution or, or maybe not. Um, because we are on Primo back office at the moment. And one of the first projects we're going to have now for 2024 is going to be, should we move to Primo VE? And in some ways, this next discovery experience has been like the, the kicker for that. I think Latrobe did a, um, a review just before the pandemic about whether to move to Primo VE and decided not to. Um, and now we're sort of going to do that again to have a look and see what's changed. Anyway, I thought the new discovery interface is interesting. In some ways, this they Primo talked about the research that they had done with users to create this interface. And one of the things they said was that, I think it was something like only 20% of people actually know what facets are. And that's why they've hidden all the filters under a more filters button, um, which I thought was, that's kind of fascinating. Um, but yeah, interesting, interesting. I would, I'd like to see that research too. Um, I do like the idea that they, they'll be adding in abstracts and summaries from articles um, to help people guide towards, is this actually a useful thing for me to look at or should I, rather than just going by the title. So I thought that was interesting. Um, but yes, they were, they were sort of like, well, we're gonna do this for Primo VE. We'll see what we can do for Primo back office. May, some of the features might roll out, some of them may not. Ella mentioned AI. AI is everywhere. Obviously, universities had a massive chat GPT induced panic at the start of the year. It's like, how do what, what do we tell people? Um, and I thought this was very interesting because after that panic was over at the library, we've had a little working group where we sort of go, well, maybe we should understand AI because it's probably going to have an impact. And I thought what was really interesting here was that the, um, so Ex Libris have, this is the sample screen that they provided and um, of what they're, they're, they're doing a prototype, they called it. It's not even a, it's not even a beta test. It's a prototype, but it's, it looks very similar. I guess if you've seen um, the Bing AI search, they're kind of following that model that I call that summary and sources model. Like, so you ask your question, you get a, a AI generated answer and response, and then it links you to the actual texts. And the way that it's doing that is by, instead of chat GPT uses just like a massive pile of stuff that's being pulled from the internet as its source material, they're actually using academic sources as their source material. So the idea is to try and get something that is actually academically sound, that is also still useful, and they were talking about conveying to users how to best use the answers, which I don't think they've at, they've got to that stage yet. But I thought that's an interesting question because, okay, here's some generated text. How should you use that in an academic context? Is it just like, I mean, when I do those Google searches, I was trying to understand the topic enough to actually ask or search meaningfully questions. 
Should you just be using this this summary as helping you understand the topic? Should you be using it to as a, as a sort of quote that you can put in? Yeah, interesting question. They did say that we can expect some beta testing in 2024. Um, I will point out that this is part of a wider pattern. So um, Lexus Nexus, their new platform has got some AI searching built into it, which doesn't generate text because you don't want to generate legal text. You want to actually quote the right text. Um, but Scopus have got an AI tool in place for or in beta test for their science journals. So it's it's becoming more and more common that a lot of these vendors are now pushing out some kind of AI search interface for their tools. All right, uh, I need to get back to my thing. Um, I haven't actually watched all of this yet, but there was like a two hour discussion about moving to Primo VE which is highly relevant to us, but I just haven't found the time to sit down and watch all of it yet. Um, but I think that's, that's that to me, that's really interesting because that will inform a lot of the questions that we will ask at La Trobe about should we move or should we not move? So Harvard was saying that they didn't move because there are too many customizations that they have in place at the moment, so it's too hard. Um, I think the University of New South Wales Library, I. I haven't actually watched it, so I don't know whether they actually made the move or not, but they definitely talked about the reasons to make it and, and the reasons not to move. And then uh, I don't know how you pronounce this free university Berlin used the move as a chance to rebuild the discovery interface from scratch. So that is particularly relevant for us. Last things, um, general observations. I attended online. I don't recommend that. <laughs> well, so it's it started the session started at 5 p.m. Melbourne time and they finished around 2 a.m. Melbourne time. Um, it was good to do it like that because it meant I actually blocked out time to attend those sessions, but it wrecked my sleep patterns for two weeks afterwards. I'm, I'm not a young person anymore. And I guess one of the other things about attending online is that you really don't have the thing that Stacy was talking about, which is the chance of networking and meeting other people. I think the first time I went, I attended last year, uh, last year, I was still using Twitter. Um, and I there was a bit of a Twitter interaction. But given what Elon Musk has done to Twitter, I, I have left it. And so therefore, I did not have that social media interaction. So it's kind of like, well, maybe maybe it would just be more sensible to actually block out a week afterwards once all the recordings up and watch them. That's very easy to say. It's much, much harder to do. And that's definitely one of the things that I'm struggling with, I guess, post Igloo. It's like, I've, you know, you come back, there's all this other work that you had to do and all the other things happen and, and catching up and like, you know, watching that video about the Primo VE transitions, I still haven't got around to it. it it's on my to-do list. Um, so there is something to be said for actually blocking out some time. And the only reason I didn't watch that Primo VE session during the actual thing was because I had a cold that day and I couldn't stay up until 2 a.m. So, uh, yeah, that's my general observations. I guess the last thing, um, I'm using the slide, desk tomorrow, slide deck tomorrow for Latrobe um, session as well. Finding the recordings is confusing because the way that they're organized is it's organized by day then it's organized by lecture room and then it's got all the different recordings um so if you don't know which day and which lecture room you want then it can be difficult to find them if someone has got a better way to do this please let me know but i'm basically suggesting that people look it up in the conference program and then go to the recordings page uh the other thing that i have done is i've tried to link the particular sessions here in, in my notes. All right, um, that's overall my observation. Look, I think it's, you know, I definitely think there's always value in attending these sort of conferences. Um, there's a lot that you learn and it's interesting that you could go from these very high level summaries like the technology from Sage report down to some very, very specific, oh, this is gonna what the new interface for Primo is going to look like. So I think that's very useful, um, yeah. Hello. Thanks, David. Questions? 
Um, yeah. Um, does anybody have? I'm just trying right, to. Stacey has said you'll have to block out the password before posting this recording. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, Ebe, that's interesting. This works in uh, talking about the AI stuff. It works in the academic context, context, but I'm yet to be convinced it will be useful for national or state library contexts. Yeah. It's an interesting one to think about. Yeah. Yeah, look, there's there's a lot that's going on and uh, La Trobe University have got a, so the, our library have got one of our strategic goals for next year is basically work out what the library's role in AI is. So, yeah. There's a lot of discussion about who's going to pay for it as well, because it yeah. costs them if for every single search it costs. So it might be like an add-on like browsing. Yeah. Um, so not like embedded within it, but there's a lot up in the air. <laughs> um, so I yeah. think a lot of people are waiting for it to have an open source version. Um, you know, like when like Solar came along and they, yeah. you know, for search engine tech, like let's, everyone will flock to the open source once it becomes available and it will be more realistic, I think. Yeah, I think a lot of the, um, I've certainly seen several vendors pushing, you know, the AI interface for the offerings, whether that's, you know, a, a vendor set of databases or whether it's a tool like um, Primo VE. But um, I did read an article the other day saying basically no one's making a profit yet out of AI and so it might all just disappear <laughs> next week. So that interesting, the open source one is an interesting idea. I hadn't, I haven't really read much about that, Stacey. Well, just for... Um, um the queries themselves so there's two parts of it there's like yeah. the building of the index which is one pot of money <laughs> and then there's the queries itself like how it generates return results so they're not building their own index um but you know so that's like already going to be like a contract sort of thing like a third party but um if they can the search portion that's like there's no open source yet for that um so they're working with someone currently but you know as soon as open source comes along then everyone will move to the free version of course you know for the open development sort of framework so we'll see what comes i guess oh yeah good point patricia <laughs> yeah well i it's an interesting point patricia because i think a lot of what these vendor-based tools are now doing is they're trying to use I don't want to turn this into a lecture about AI, but you train it on a corpus of data. And so, and because like, you know, I'm, I'm EBSCO, I've got a massive corpus of data, which is all these academic articles. Maybe I can train the AI just to answer based on that rather than on, you know, books and, and Reddit posts and, and, and stuff that I've stolen off, you know, Google books. So um, I'll, I'll very briefly this is the one page screen I put together as a as a um, discussion point for uh, Latrobe. I don't know if people can see that. But this is sort of mentioned that, you know, Lexus Plus and Scopus. So these are some interface screenshots from Lexus, Scopus and Primo Conversational Discovery. Um, but there was a lot of questions that have been raised about that. So those are the sort of things that we're thinking about. I don't know if that's useful. I'll stop sharing. Have you talked Dave into presenting Ella? I see he's here. He, he did agree to to <laughs> talk. Yes, he did agree. Yes. <laughs> so Dave, uh, the floor's yours. If you want to share anything, and I know you just commented, so you're you're around. Oh, crap. <laughs> catch, um... him. catch him! Catch <laughs> him! I, I I was attending, but I didn't realize I had to talk because I said I'd do it, but then I didn't hear anything. So I thought, oh, yeah, fair enough. Um, I suppose the conference went kind of wellish. We did take a bit of time again trying to extract all the videos because um, unlike David, I get to watch them all a second time. All of the streams for the three, for the four days and trying to extract because it comes, a, as you guys know, with Zoom, it comes as one big flat file and I had to chop them up and that took time. 
Um, so it'd be interesting too on how I can publish those presentations better because I've tried various ways and this is the fourth year doing it and it's still can't figure out how to do it nicely. So I'm always interested in that. Um, I took on board what you said about the online thing. I think next year we'll try to look at some sort of online chatty thing. I don't know what we're going to do. We'll find something. Um, yeah. And um, yes, unfortunately the people that did attend apologies for the lack of air conditioning, but as they said, it's never normally a heat wave in September. And the reality is um, there's no students on campus at that time. So who cares? So that's another reason why they had no air conditioning, which makes sense. Um, I think a lot of it went wellish. I do recommend listening to that final keynote speaker, uh, Jerome Bart. He was really good, even though he didn't show up until like five minutes before he went on, which just caused a little bit of angst for me. Bloody academic sometimes. But anyway, uh, that's about it. Um, and next year, if you can, Copenhagen. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Uh, does anybody have any questions conference related while we're still talking about it? Uh, Kate says, I found it less exhausting moving room to room online than in person and taking notes and screenshots live. I think I'm a convert to the online conference. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I did find it was, um, especially with no air conditioning, walking up to the fourth floor for a half hour presentation and then walking down again and then into a d another building and up to the second floor uh, yeah. was quite exhausting. I think I Lots saw a of... lot of people, yeah, a lot of people were just like skipping presentations and yeah. hunting for shade and breeze. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> vend luckily... vending machines and water. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> So luckily it broke, the heat wave broke on the first night. So it didn't go the whole conference. It broke during the social event, which was really perfect. There was a storm uh, during the social event and it broke. So, and oh, I'd just like to say a that few of us I, got stuck under a tree outside. While yeah, it was yeah. Pouring well, down we the rain. <laughs> we got rained on as well. But I would like to say as well that I would say to Dave that I think it went more than just wellish. I think you did a great job. So please pass along thanks to the whole steering committee for a, another great conference. Thank you. No, I'll let them know. I'll let the programming planning committee know. There you go. Uh, yeah, Jennifer's asked where we can find the links. We'll um, share an email to the listserv after this with this recording um, and information on how to access all the Igloo recordings um, as well and with the program and everything. Um, and we'll also highlight specific presentations that people have mentioned today in that email. So, yeah, you don't have to remember. We'll send it to you. <laughs> uh, all right. Any other questions before I move on? I've got a quick little yearly wrap-up thing to do, but any other questions about the conference while we're still here? Give you 30 seconds in case you're typing. Need some countdown music. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I suppose more broadly, um, and this is probably a question for any of you who attended, whether or not it was um, sort of active, actively supported by your institution or whether it was something that you sort of pursued on your own and your institution allowed you to attend, if you sort of get where I'm coming from with the distinction. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, well, for Latrobe, online attendance is um, actively advertised to people who um, are interested. It's definitely not something we can afford to pay for the whole library to attend. Um, but David and I have both, so David and I both attended online last year. Um, and so now, yeah, I think I think they've realised it's something that at least our two teams, um, so I'm collections, David's in digital discovery. I think it's um, something that both of our teams get a lot out of. Um, but in terms of physical attendance, um, that was just because I'm the chair of ANSREG and I decided I wanted to go. Um, but they did contribute. They, um, yeah, Latrobe did contribute to some of my trip but I also took a holiday. So they used that as an excuse not to <laughs> contribute. So out of curiosity, this got raised by a couple of people. If the registration form went up, 
without mentioning the virtual attendee uh, attendance, would that work for you? Because we're talking about releasing the form, making it physical initially, and then put in the virtual stuff, you know, like a month later for the registrations. Because they said it probably they... wouldn't make a difference. Okay. I think I think it's the distance is the biggest, the the okay. distance and the the time and the people like David and I, the people who would be attending in person. Do we have time for them to take a whole week out of their jobs? Do we have the money, the the professional development money to spend on just the same people going every year? Do we spread it around? All of you know, there's so many, mm -hmm. so many things. And from the Andridge perspective, if we happen to hold a conference in North Asia somewhere, do you guys attend? More people would attend or is it still too far? I, I would like say very, yes. <laughs> I feel like that's a very individual question depending on each yeah. probably institution, yeah. whether or not it's just the distance or whether it's a you know travel as a whole or, um, yeah, I don't know. If, yeah, I, I and like I put, it, I do it, put make it, it in easier. the chat. <laughs> Everyone put it in the chat if you go to Asia. <laughs> I'm selfish. I want to go to Europe. <laughs> yeah, it it is nice getting to go to Europe, but I I do think more <laughs> more people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's it's even something we're coming across within Andreg itself that even for people in New Zealand, Australia is too far. For people in Perth, Melbourne is too far. Like it just depends on the institution. Some are just saying no to everything. Some will it depend. Uh, David, you had your hand up first. Thank you. Um, just on that point, Ella, one of the reasons that if people are interested in attending in person is obviously you need to sell the business value of it. You mentioned that you got to meet with support and with people directly, which is one of the advantages of going to a conference in person. Do you want to talk a little bit about the outcomes of that? Yeah, so that and it's it's not something I down. it's yeah, it's not something that I was aware of before I registered um that this was good like it, it just wasn't something I thought about um and then like Stacy said Moshe contacted me because they had the list of attendees and said we're going to be here and then uh Carolyn Richings as well um contacted me for a meeting as well so yeah it's um it wasn't something I like I could have included that in my application form as a um, as a bonus for Latrobe because once that opportunity did come up, everybody was very excited and I got pages and pages of questions to ask in these meetings that I wasn't qualified to ask um, or understand the answers to, but I did write lots of notes. Um, but, yeah, it is something that is has become more beneficial to us than I thought it was going to um, because there are, yeah, in Australia we just don't get those opportunities to meet ex libris in person and I actually don't think anybody mentioned it but was it something like 80 ex libris employees were present um in Leuven it was a very large Dave, number Dave, I think it was 75 80 Dave will know for sure probably uh yeah it was 75 um so they had not only ex libris but Clar well because of the way they organized how Claravit runs there were Claravit support people there as well so there's web of science people. There was all sorts of people there. Yeah. So it is like, if you have a question, there'll be somebody there to answer it. Um, if, yeah, if that's something that helps your applications and stuff. Uh, Margie, you have your hand up. Yeah. Hi. I'm just talking to the, if it was in Southeast Asia question, um, Dave, our institution, when it was in Singapore, supported me because I was presenting a paper. So presenting a paper at a conference tends to get you there. If you just want to go and watch, you're probably not going to get there. Um, and I think COVID sort of turned that all on its head because everyone got used to doing Zoom and being online and stuff. But the advantages of being there in person uh, definitely the networking, the meeting with Ex Libris in person, the meeting other institutions that you would never imagine um, are even using the same products, say from, you know, Italy, 
UK, America, everywhere. So it's really invaluable and particularly getting to talk to Ex Libris in person to go over all your pain points and, you know, things that we mentioned are actually currently being fixed. So that's that's what's really valuable about being there. But I too quite like going to Europe. Uh, anybody else before I switch modes? I can see lots of people talking about air travel and things in the chat. So I will make sure I will get a copy of the chat. So I will put that all into notes and send it to Dave so he knows what everybody thinks. Uh, all right. Let us quickly do a end of year wrap up. Um, happy 1st of November, everybody. Um, we're officially transitioning into Christmas season. Is it too early to put my Christmas tree up? Probably, but I probably yeah. will do it soon anyway. <laughs> no, the answer is no, Alison. It's never too early. Uh, all right. So very quickly, um, there were quite a few changes to the committee this year. Um, everything has felt a little bit chaotic, um, but it's starting to settle down now. Um, we said goodbye to Lynn Billington, Claire Brocklehurst and Romana Challens earlier this year. And we also said goodbye to long-standing committee members, Stacey and Amelia Rowe. Um, so we thank everybody for their service to the community. Uh, so obviously because of that, we have some new committee members this year. So welcome to Lorraine, Sean, Alison and Caroline. Uh, zooming through a uh, quick recap of the events from this year. Um, all recordings are available on our YouTube channel, which I will include in the email wrap up of this session. Um, OAI PMH webinar was in March, uh, which the recording is available. Um, we held a two day online conference in July. Uh, we had over 200 registrations and an average of 100 live attendees across both days, which we were pretty impressed with considering how little uh, we time we had to plan everything uh, yeah so planning a conference while also welcoming new committee members was a bit chaotic and I don't know if anybody else remembers but the first day of the conference the online conference was my first day as chair um, so that's indicates how chaotic everything's been uh, but thank you everybody for your help and hard work and thanks to everybody who attended um, then we've got advocacy. Uh, we meet with Ex Libris quarterly as a committee um, to discuss community issues. So this is a quick reminder. Um, if you have an issue you want us to raise directly with Ex Libris, um, please email the list or somebody on the committee if you don't want to send it to the whole list. Uh, you can email me personally as well. Um, or And we also have, it's on the next slide, I think, we have an email address, um, ansreg.committee at gmail.com. Uh, so email us there. Um, so, yeah, this year theme of the day is we mostly discuss support, um, which isn't really surprising. So Project Flash, the ongoing support issues, but then we also had a little bit of discussion about the IATSIS thesauri development um, and documentation. And then finally, I have an announcement to make. Woo! Um, I'm pleased to announce that we are getting a bit more organized this time um, and we'll be holding an Android conference solely online um, as a result of all of your feedback uh, in June, 2024. Uh, where the dates and theme and keynote announcements will come early next year. So we're still working out exactly when, because um, I believe Vala is also around that time. So we'll we'll work it out. Uh, we are going to have to charge a very small fee based on your institution size, although we are asking for feedback about this, about whether it's like one um, charge per institution uh, is better or individual um, would be more likely to be approved by your um, institution. Uh, it'll probably be less than $50 um, total for in, an institution, um, but 
basically this is a reminder that we are a not-for-profit um, our funds are used to cover our registration as a business um, keynote fees and gifts for our speakers um, so it, that's why it's a pretty small fee but we are have been recently dipping into our existing funds to keep the account um, the conferences free during COVID um, but as the saying goes times they are changing <laughs> Uh, all right, I can see some comments, but I can't read them. Hold on, please. Uh, talking of Amelia Rowe, her old position at RMIT has just been advertised. Excellent. That took a very long time. Yeah, RMIT must be as efficient as Latrobe at organizing new jobs. Uh, where will it be held in Copenhagen? Yes, it's at the Royal Danish Library in Copenhagen, next year's Igloo Conference. So if you feel like checking out the Royal Danish Library, no, it's <clears throat> sorry. That that's the host. Ah, okay. the host is the Royal Danish Library. There'll be some sessions in the Royal Danish Library, but we had to go to a conference center, which is right. fairly close to the Royal Danish Library. So but all the still get to check out the Royal Danish Library. <laughs> yeah, the Black Diamond they call it. Oh. Uh. Can we talk to Ex Libris about the release note format? Um, yes, I will write that down. Uh, that is a great suggestion. Um, what has happened to closing Salesforce cases four weeks instead of four two? Yes, this they keep talking about it. Um, as Stacy has said, um, they mentioned to us in one of our quarterly meetings earlier in the year um, that it must have been just after a lunar. Um, that they were going to ask the community. So they asked us and we said four weeks. And then we asked you guys at the conference and we again told Ex Libris Australia and New Zealand say four weeks is best. Then at Igloo, they asked the same question and said, we're still seeking feedback. And it, I was surprised um, at the reaction in the room. Um, so that was on the last day. And I think they asked the question incorrectly. Um, so a lot of people, I don't think a lot of people understood what question they were actually asking um, because only less than half the room put their hands up for um, extending it to four weeks. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, I think people didn't expect the sudden question. Yeah, it was it was a bit of a weird vibe at the time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, and I think they're also just kind of putting it off. Um, but, yes, every time we talk to them, they say they, they haven't got enough feedback yet from everywhere else in the world. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully uh, soon we'll ask them again. We'll, we're, we've still got one more quarterly meeting to go for the year, so we will bring it up again uh, to find and let you know. Um, I think that's all. Yes, that's all I have. Excellent. Um, finally, does anybody have any questions for anybody, for me, for the committee, for anybody who talked today? All right, great. As I said, um, we've been recording this, um, and we will send out the recording and a wrap up of all the links and everything, uh, to the list, maybe not this afternoon, but hopefully by the end of the week. Thank you everybody for coming.